and uh, I have uh, yeah, the pleasure of being your chair and your question asker today. And I have uh, Ingvill and James with me here. Um, before I go into uh, introducing the format to you a little bit, I uh, will just introduce our speakers to you for a minute before I then mostly give the floor over to them today. So we have uh, Ingvill Buhl here, um, who's an Associate Professor of International Relations at the University of Southern Denmark with us here. We're very delighted to have you. Um, it's not been too long, you joined us recently, um, and she is the uh, Principal Investigator of an ERC research project on autonomous weapon system and international norms, also called auto norms for short. And uh, in that capacity, you're also here today talking about your research on autonomous weapons. Um, and autonomy and how states deal with that. She is also the associate editor of Global Society, if I'm rightly informed. Um, and her research agenda deals with questions of peace and security with a theoretical focus, combining practice theories and constructivist international relations theories. Um, and in that, she's mainly interested in looking at processes of policy and normative change. And that, of course, in uh, the area of weaponized artificial intelligence where also the project lies. Um, but she also looks at the use of force in general, United Nations peacekeeping, um, and the dynamics of the UN Security Council. Previously, before joining us here, um, Ingwell was a senior lecturer in international relations at the University of Kent in Canterbury, and uh, at Japan, a Japan Society um, for the Promotion of Science International Research Fellow. I hope I said that somewhat right. Um, and had an affiliation at the United Nations University and the University of Tokyo while uh, mm -hmm. serving in that position. And she also lectured at Eberhard Karls University in Tübingen, Germany, where she completed her PhD in 2013. Now, on the other end of the table, we have uh, James, who is a Danish uh, inter <laughs> Institute. Uh, he was an assistant professor at the Danish Institute for Advanced Studies. You got it. That's what I'm trying to say. <laughs> um, and is also with us here at the Center for War Studies. He's also an associate fellow with LSE Ideas at the London School of Economics and a special advisor to the UK Parliament's all-party parliamentary group on drones. And of course, it is drones that he will be speaking uh, about today. He has previously been a visiting research fellow at Stanford University and at Yale University and also the University of Oxford and is also the co-founder and co-governor of the uh, BISA War Studies section, um, which is uh, the British International Studies Association's part that looks at war studies. And that was founded last year, I think, if That's I remember right. correctly. Um, other than that, he uh, also serves as a TV presenter <laughs> for uh, the Untold History series and uh, has a, a TEDx talk that's quite popular and uh, yeah, is uh, pretty busy keeping up with uh, his media appearances and uh, all things like that. His research, aside from drones, also focuses on uh, contemporary security policy and the history of warfare more broadly. So we have two very interesting experts with us today. I hope uh, you will find their presentations as interesting as uh, I'm sure I will. And uh, before I hand over to them, a quick note on the format. That is, we have agreed with James and Ingvild that they will speak for about 15 minutes each um, and present their research. Um, and uh, after that, I will kick it off with asking a handful of questions, two, three questions maybe. And uh, there is this Q&A function in the Zoom meeting. So I would uh, encourage you to use that, post your questions there, and then I will ask your questions uh, on behalf of you to our two speakers today. And uh, yeah, I hope you will enjoy the meeting and uh, it'll be very interesting for all of us. Without further ado, I'm handing off to James. I think Please. Ingo's gonna go first. <laughs> <Yeah>. Okay, <laughs> sorry, Ingo. <laughs> Fair enough. Thank you so much, Emily, for your presentation. Um, so, so I will talk about, as Emily said, my, my research, mainly my new research project on autonomous weapon systems and norms. Um, and this is going to be the program of work uh, for me today. So I will talk a bit briefly about what we mean by autonomous weapon systems, um, as there are very many competing definitions around, uh, and uh, talk about the spectrum of autonomy. Um, then I will talk about uh, why states develop OS and, and, um, and which ones. And then I briefly give an introduction about why this de development is potentially problematic, looking at legal, ethical and security implications. 
And then I will close off with, um, with a bit more about my project, where we'll look at how will OS change um, use of force norms. And that will be the, my main kind of endeavor for the next five years here at SDU, um, the Center for War Studies. So what are autonomous weapon systems? If you use a very straightforward definition, uh, these are systems that once activated can track, identify, and attack targets with violent force and without further human intervention. And this without further human intervention is kind of the key characteristic feature of so-called autonomous weapon systems. So to, to get to this, uh, to this feature of autonomy, we need to have a basic understanding of what autonomy means. So autonomy basically is the, the ability of a machine to execute a task without human involvement using interactions of computer programming with the environment. So we're talking about a form of um, uh, weapon systems that has uh, as kind of sensors and through the kind of uh, sensory input it receives, it executes certain, certain actions. Um, so these are really different forms of weaponized artificial intelligence. So these are basically weapon systems that in some shape or form can, can think or make decisions. Um, while this kind of autonomous weapon systems um, term sounds as if it's kind of neatly framed. Actually, the, the situation on the ground is much more complicated. And uh, we can typically portray this uh, along a spectrum of autonomy. So where we have kind of remote controlled weapon systems on the one side and then uh, fully autonomous weapon systems on the other side of the spectrum. So on the one side, we define uh, remote control systems that most of us are quite familiar with. So these would include, for example, armed drones, uh, which remain under manual control of humans and require humans uh, or human input to execute their tasks. And then on the other hand, uh, we have what I just defined, so what is also sometimes referred to as fully autonomous systems, where humans will no longer be involved in kill decisions in the use phase of the system, and the system operates completely on its own. But actually what we see um, at the moment and what most of the interesting um, research lies is kind of this middle zone in between these two extreme poles, uh, which I've labeled here complex human-machine interaction, so these are systems that can operate independently to some degree, but are under supervisory um, control or oversight by a human. And the supervision differs quite significantly in quality. Um, and just to give you a better idea of what, what this could mean, um, these are uh, for example, different levels of human control that these systems uh, work under. Uh, so these basically define the quality of human control that these systems uh, operate within. And you can typically differentiate between human in the loop and human on the loop systems. So human in the loop systems means that uh, humans actively participate in selecting specific targets and in deciding to use force. Um, and here it depends a bit on what, uh, what their role uh, can be as you see here with scenarios A and B. Uh, but then on loop systems have a significantly reduced role of the human because here really the human operator only monitors system actions and only intervenes when necessary. So humans here only react to specific targets as suggested by the program. Um, and the difference between scenarios C and D are basically the time that human operators have to react to this, to react to, to the targets suggested by the system. And then of course the table closes with systems that are completely without human involvement. Um, as the spectrum of autonomy that I just showed you implies, um, this is not a topic of this in future, but this is actually something that is happening right now. So we already have a number of existing weapon systems that use automated or autonomous features in their critical functions. And critical functions are used always to refer to targeting in some shape or form. So as you see here, according to CIPRI estimates, according um, um, states already use more than 130 systems that can autonomously track targets. And just to, just to give you an idea of some of these systems that we see that have autonomous or automated functions. So air defense systems, for example, active protection systems and counter drone systems. Um, so these are kind of all along this kind of spectrum of, of various forms of human machine interaction uh, and under different forms of super, super human supervision that, uh, that are of a different quality. Um, and then we, we also have um, one category of systems, so-called loitering munitions, also sometimes um, referred to colloquially as kamikaze drones. Um, and there, um, um, a kind of a key example of one of these systems is the Harop or Harpy system manufactured by Israel. So these are, um, I want to highlight these briefly because these are actually fully autonomous weapon systems. So in the sense that once they are launched, there's no communications link back to human operator, uh, but they actually really um, operate autonomously. Um, so what they do is that they look for a particular radar signature 
um, remain loitering in air until they find them. Uh, and once they find the signature they're looking for, they're launching themselves onto the target, uh, destroying the target and destroying themselves in the process. So that's why we have this denomer of um, kamikaze drones. Uh, by the way, uh, if you're following current events, such drones have been used uh, on the Azeri side in the current uh, Nagorno-Karabakh conflict, which I'm sure will also uh, maybe appear later on in this in this talk because it's a it's a very useful illustration of um, how many of these weapon systems with varying forms of autonomy are being used in a current conflict, also changing the modes of uh, warfare in the process. Um, so some of the key developers of um, systems with autonomous features are um, depicted here. So you see here, there's also an element or a clear element of great power competition within this because China, the US and Russia are among the, the uh, three of the key countries who are investing heavily into AI and into military applications um, of AI. And now why, why are these states actually developing these systems? So why are they investing in this technology and what is, what is in it for them? Um, if we want to summarize the reasons or the, um, the, the reasons why states develop us, it's mostly to do with uh, reasons of military efficiency and effectiveness. So um, a key reason is uh, speed and endurance. So um, the human is kind of, um, has, has, I think, for, for quite long been identified as the slowest part of the military decision-making process and including machines and targeting decision-making could speed things up enormously, especially in terms of sh shortening the sensor to shooter loop. Uh, and this increasing speed could be identified as a war fighting advantage. Um, of course, it also um, carries significant proliferation risks and we can talk more about this in the Q&A maybe. There's also this issue of endurance. Uh, so um, uh, obviously um, these kind of systems, if they um, operate completely autonomously, could uh, gather intelligence across large areas over long periods of time, um, which could be used for further, um, further wartime strategy. Then there's this issue of contested communication links. So, um, so OS could be operated in environments other than remote control systems. So here really the, the idea is that sometimes you want, some states are looking for, for ways of operating systems where communication links are contested or impossible, for example, um, um, in the deep sea, uh, where remote control signals or communication links don't really travel well. So you would need a system that is able to operate on its, on its own. Uh, then you also have the issue of scalability, force multiplier effect and cost saving. So here it's really the, uh, this, this kind of feature that distinguishes um, these kind of systems from other areas of weapons technology is that AI can basically be integrated into all kinds of different weapon systems and platforms, thereby increasing their capabilities. Um, it could also um, enhance capabilities in the sense that it provides less expensive military systems with increased capabilities at the same time. So we've seen, for example, um, researchers saying that especially swarms of drones could overwhelm expensive high-tech systems and therefore generate significant cost saving for militaries. And then there's also, of course, the issue of processing information. I found this, this interesting quote from a US DOD staffer saying that each drone deployed by the US records more than three NFL seasons worth of HD footage each day. And these are, of course, just the data produced by, by drones themselves. Of course, we, we can think about all kinds of other uh, data sources that militaries might want to sort through in terms of gathering intelligence. And um, yeah, this amount of data can, can simply not be sorted through manually by, by humans. So there's also this drive to integrate AI into the processing or intelligence um, processing of these kind of uh, big, big data sources and identifying patterns in this sense. Um, now you might think this, 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 this sounds quite a convincing reasoning for, for why states are, are integrating these technologies into their modern militaries. Uh, but I also think that this development um, of autonomous features in warfare raises a number of problematic developments um, that I have here classified according to three, um, uh, the issue of law, ethics and security and stability. Uh, so starting with law, it is at the moment highly speculative uh, um, or questionable whether these systems will ever be able to comply with the demands of international humanitarian law in particular, also international human rights law for that matter. And the reason for that being is that uh, many of the principles of IHL, such as for example, distinctions, so how to discriminate between combatants and civilians, require contextual human assessment. So it's, it's not, it, it's, 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 it's near to impossible to define clear criteria that would make up a civilian and a combatant, especially in kind of modern urban warfare settings that could then be programmable 
into a machine uh, or into an algorithm. And this is especially the case if you think, as I said, about urban warfare and about the fast changing context and dynamic nature of warfare as such. Um, so um, at the moment, uh, uh, developing autonomous weapon systems that could adhere to these principles presupposes that um, researchers will be able to solve many current research problems in AI that have been um, kind of um, troubling the field for, for years. Um, and then there's also the issue of the accountability gap. So what if uh, an OAS makes a decision that amounts to a war crime? Who's responsible for that? Who's accountable? Um, there's a long list of potentially responsible persons, such as the military commander in charge, the human operator over overseeing the, the OAS, but also manufacturers, software programmers, even the person maybe who or the people who conducted the weapons review in the first place. Um, so people on that list may defend themselves um, on the grounds of them only really having very limited agency in the decision-making process. And also because um, autonomous weapon systems due to their complexity um, might, uh, might uh, engage in unexpected behaviors on the battlefield. So that is an accountability issue, which is, which is quite major. Uh, then in terms of ethics, uh, there are also many um, commentators who say that, that if, you, if, if you allow an autonomous machine to target a human being, you basically objectify the human being. So you reduce the human being to a data point, which, which does not account for human dignity or actually violates human dignity. And this kind of comes from the idea that, that really um, uh, soldiers uh, as, as human beings can, can fully appreciate what it means to take human life at least in theory. I mean, so, I mean, there's this, there's this essential nature of being human that allows us to, to, to acknowledge somebody else as a human being and to acknowledge what it means to take um, their life. Um, and also this kind of idea that if you can just kind of delegate kill decisions to, to a machine, then you don't have to trouble yourself with that um, on your own conscience. So it's a big ethical dimension to that. And in terms of security and stability, um, um, as I said, so there, there's a risk of an arms race. So if one, if one um, of the key military powers would, would really um, uh, be able to field many of these systems, then that decreases the pressure on other military powers to do the same or to, be a to, to, ret to retain the competitive edge. And, and, and I think we've, we've actually seen in terms of the proliferation of armed drones over just the last 10 years. So ten, um, if you think about 10 years ago, when kind of the Obama administration was the first to kind of use drones um, more widely in different theaters of war to what we have now, where, where lesser military powers such as um, Azerbaijan and Armenia are using many different types of drones um, on the battlefield. And of course, there's also cyber vulnerabilities to account for that could lead to unintended conflicts through uh, spoofing or hacking, for example. Now, fundamentally, or more fundamentally, what, what I think is, is, um, in, is important about uh, this increasingly autonomous features in weapon systems is that it will change the nature of warfare itself. So, and I mean that in the sense that they will change how I think states consider the use of force as appropriate. So what they think in terms of using force is an appropriate means of warfare. In other words, I think, um, I think about the question, how will autonomous weapon systems change norms? And really investigating this question of finding answers to this is the main objective of my research here at SDU for the next five years. Because what we see here are two processes that are going on at the same time. On the one hand, this issue of autonomous weapon systems has been debated at the UN in Geneva under the auspices of the UN Convention on Certain Conventional Weapons and a much longer title that I won't really spell out here since 2014, so all of six years already. Actually, next week we have a next session um, of this um, group of governmental experts uh, talking about this. And what we see here emerging really is a joint concern about, about uh, human control as necessary. So many states, I think most states agree that it is unacceptable to completely uh, do away with human control uh, in the use of force, but there's less agreement about the specific quality of human control that is needed to ensure it remains meaningful um, and uh, to ensure the, the, the legal um, employment of these systems. Um, so, um, and also, of course, while some states are calling for new law on autonomous weapon systems, other states think that new laws uh, or negotiating new law is premature. So simultaneously to this process of deliberation that we see ongoing at the UN, we see that states have fielded and will likely continue to field more and more systems with autonomous features in their critical functions. And they do this before global rules uh, take shape as the process at the UN in Geneva kind of proceeds at a glacial speed at the moment. So this means that norms 
which understand as understandings of appropriateness in this area will likely not be set through the public deliberations at the UN, but will emerge and change in practices of developing, testing, and deploying autonomous weapon systems. And, um, and this is really the main analytical um, objective of my project to look at how these practices they've just described can lead to norms. And I will end my presentation, which has been going on for a while now, with a very brief illustration of this. So how can practices make norms? You may ask yourselves. Um, so, and I want to return you to the question of meaningful human control. So as I said, um, the, there's general agreement about this term being important, but not about the precise content of this or what this means precisely. Um, and at the same time, um, um, the issue of human control and weapon systems is actually not new. So it has been an increasing issue since states have integrated these autonomous features or automated features into weapon systems. And I want to illustrate this with the um, example of air defense systems that are in wide, wide global use. So at least around 90 states possess air defense systems um, and these 90 states possess often more than one. Uh, practices of operating such systems, I argue, have already shaped perceptions of what constitutes appropriate human machine interaction and therefore meaningful human control. Um, and I think in the process of using these systems, what we have seen is that human operators of these systems have been relegated from active roles to kind of passive supervisory roles without acknowledging what this means from a perspective of human control. So we now are in a situation where although humans are involved, so these are in the loop system or on the loop systems quite often, they retain minimal, but at the same time, impossibly complex roles in operating such systems. And we can talk a bit more about what this means in the Q and A if you're so interested. So I think this is kind of an emerging norm that comes from these practices, so emerging norm of what counts as appropriate meaningful human control that has not been discussed or liberated upon, but has been an outcome of these, of these practices. So I think it therefore serves as an excellent illustration of how practices can, can, can make norms um, in, in the use of systems uh, with autonomous features. And I'll, I'll end it here and hand over to James at this point. Thanks for listening. Perfect, thank you very much. James, floor is yours. Fascinating, thanks, Ingo. Um, hello, I'm James Rogers. First of all, apologies for my voice. It's a bit raspy today. I was shouting far too much on the rugby field at the weekend, um, but it is a pleasure to be here. Thank you to the Centre for War Studies and SDU Rio for inviting me. It's really great to be able to talk to our, our military personnel, um, to our policymakers, and of course, our world leading regional industry and our world leading students here at SDU many of whom actually work on some of the projects that I run about vulnerabilities of the drone age. And I'm actually the country director, the NATO country director of the NATO SBS funded vulnerabilities of the drone age project. And I'll be talking about some of the findings from that here today, because whereas Ingvall works more on uh, the state use of autonomous weapons, and that's where your drone technologies cross over, I'll be talking more about the vulnerabilities of the commercial drones to our societies, both back home in Europe, but also on the battlefield. It's important for me to say, though, as I start, that I am drone positive. I'm not drone negative. I really do see the ways in which drones can help create our robotic resilient societies that we want in the future. We only need to look at the recent responses to COVID. Drones, when you look back through history, were first invented back in 1916, 1917, to remove the human from the threat of death on the battlefield during the First World War, from that entrenched warfare, from face-to-face -face battle. And if we look through to today, a very different world crisis, but once again, as a society, we've turned to drones to separate our most vulnerable, but also our highly trained medical personnel from the threat of COVID. Drones have been used by medical professionals to help measure temperatures, but they've also been used to make sure that pharmacies and again, medical professionals can send medicines in a detached manner to vulnerable care homes to make sure those who are most vulnerable can be supplied with the medicines that they need. And in the future, we will have thousands of drones in our skies going from rural distribution centers to inner city delivery hubs. Some will weigh a few pounds, they will deliver 
well, our drones that we buy off Amazon, buy a drone to our doorsteps, and some will weigh a few tons, and they will take us back to work, back to home, perhaps back from the pub if needed. These will be the futures that we have ahead of us. But my research over the last 10 years, which has taken me from China and the Middle East to the Sahel, to Silicon Valley and Washington DC, really does highlight just some of the vulnerabilities that we're going to face both now and into the immediate future because a lack of government regulations, a lack of infrastructure to help us deal with these drone threats, and of course, the shortfalls in counter drone technologies. Um, and so I suppose it's there where I will begin, engaging a little bit in just some of the core examples that show us these vulnerabilities of the drone age. It wasn't so much of a problem during the 1990s when terrorist actors started to experiment with drones. Drones were high tech, they were difficult to use. And so in the cases where terrorists did try and use them, they actually failed. You can take the case of Um Shurikyo, um, run by a charismatic, um, somewhat mad leader, Ansari, who saw himself as a Jesus Christ type Buddha figure who wanted to bring about the end of the world. And he had a fascination with new technologies, but also biological and chemical weapons. And this convergence with trying to create Armageddon technologies and biological agents led him naturally to drones. And there are experimentations where they fitted containers and ventilation fans to these drones. They packed them full of things like salmon liquid. And the aim was to fly them high above Japanese cities, dispersing death and chaos as they went. Tests didn't go very well. Uh, they even tried to disperse these from a van but ended up poisoning their own personnel. And instead they went with a very low tech option because the high tech was too difficult. They ended up filling bags full of sarin liquid, putting them on the Tokyo subway in 1995, and they stabbed the bags with sharpened umbrellas, almost like a, a, a twisted bond plot. And this ended up very much, uh, I think the injury rate was 13,000 people injured and 5,000 people, five people who were killed during that attack. So that wasn't very successful in terms of how the drones were used, but it really did show that there was intent to use drones for malicious means. And so we can skip forward up to 2015, but back to Japan, and we can look at the case of the so-called atomic drone. Now here, an environmental activist called Mr. Yukimoto, who self-described him as a terrorist. He was an environmental terrorist. And he was very much enraged by the Japanese government's attempts at trying to reopen their nuclear power stations after the rupture of the Fukushima power plant after the 2011 Japanese earthquake. And so what he did is he went down to the power plant and gathered a quite amount of radioactive material from the beaches there, took it back to his home, he filled it into containers, he then bought the drone online like any one of us can do, painted it black, to make sure that you couldn't see the lights flashing in the sky. And then he fitted his container full of radioactive waste to the drone, flew it up into the night sky by the Japanese prime minister's house, flew it high onto the roof, landed it onto the roof, because of course, drones are far easier to use nowadays. They have a far higher payload capacity. They have an organic camera built in. They have reliable transmission and control. And their gyroscopes mean that even in a higher wind, they can remain stable. And so it was that easier use, simple high tech, that allowed this environmental terrorist to fly this drone with radioactive material to the top of the Japanese prime minister's house, where it sat radiating for two weeks without anybody noticing. And to excuse the pun, it was at this point in more drone research fields that we started to look up and take notice at just what commercial drones could do. And there are a plethora of examples. We can jump from assassination attempts at the Venezuelan president, Muro, or we could go to Gatwick Airport in 2018, which was closed for over 72 hours. Both famous examples. But I wanna take you to one even more recently. Because whereas the 2015 attack via drone was conducted by a high tech drone, but it was still pretty simple. You know, you go back to a phantom drone back then and it can fly for about 10 minutes 
Um, it might have a camera built in, but not all of them did. If you jump forward to drones that are used today, they have a far higher payload. Look at a Mavic 2 Pro. It has the ability to fly for 31 minutes, over eight kilometers, and travel at speeds of 72 kilometers per hour. There are also available online, you have free apps that you can download, and of course, software that can take you through tutorials of how you link up multiple drones, not just single drones, so that you can conduct your business activities very much legitimately, but also if a hostile actor wanted to use rudimentary swarms for a drone attack, then they could. And so let's just look at one of these ways in which the more high-tech drones have been used in 2020. Now, we can look at China just before the COVID-19 outbreak. There was another global outbreak of a disease, and it was African swine flu, one that's been largely overlooked as a result, of course, COVID really taking hold from February and March this year. And in this case, African swine flu was causing a major food security problem in China with the build up to Chinese New Year. Pork is one of the most um, preferred dishes during that period. And it was spreading across the pig farms of China. And so what organized criminals did was they took infected pig meat. And this is a biological agent, vast amounts of infected pig meat, as much as they could, kilograms and kilograms worth, and packed them into the bottom of commercial drones. They then flew those drones from a number of kilometers away and then they flew them into pig farms where there were thousands and thousands of pigs. And then this meat would be eaten, the infection would spread. And why would they want to do this? Well, it turns out in China, the organized criminal gangs have a monopoly over frozen pig meat. So the more fresh pig meat that's infected, up goes the price of the frozen pig meat. But also it meant that they could buy the infected pig meat for a cheaper price and then ship it over to other parts of China as uninfected pig meat. Now, I didn't think I'd be talking about pig meat so much in my research, especially when back in 20, 2008, like you, I was talking about Obama drones. But this is important when we're trying to look at ways in which drones can be used as a security threat in society, because this allowed for the rapid, rapid transfer of an infectious agent, a biological infectious agent, via simple to use high tech drone means across a country. And so it really does indicate to us just some of the ways in which drones can be used. I can go into more details about this. My time in the Middle East, I was afforded the opportunity to inspect terrorist drones used by Houthi rebels, drones that had initially been supplied by the state, Iran, and had been used, of course, to blow up places like the Aramco oil refineries or take out major shipping or to conduct assassinations in the region. These are larger drones but they were augmented with commercial technologies. So as I was inspecting these drone systems, you start to see how the easy transfer of commercial drone tech from Europe, I'm talking about Irish motors, uh, Czech, motors from the Czech Republic are a couple that I saw as well, mixed in with higher transmission um, capable technologies from commercial drones, um, just a range of different, even boring things like the wing flaps and um, the, the different wirings that were supplied from Chinese commercial companies. These are the boring things that made these drones fly. They were a hybrid of state tech and commercial tech. Um, and so once we look at these, we really start to see just the ways in which drones can pose a domestic threat, but also a threat um, internationally as well. Emily, how long do I have? You're good. You still have a, a few more minutes if you want to. Fantastic. Let's go into the case about ISIS, of course, because this was one of the, well, most iconic ways in which drones have been used as a quite viable hostile system. And these really were commercial drone systems that were bought in their thousands via shell companies back in Europe. So you had two Bangladeshi brothers in the UK um, who were based in Wales. They ran shell companies in Spain. They ran shell companies back in Bangladesh. They linked up with a Danish national, Basil Hassan, who ran a cell out of Copenhagen. And between them, they were able to acquire vast amounts of thermal imaging cameras that you fit to the bottom of drones, motors, which would allow them, the commercial elements to be even more souped up, even further transmitters that allowed you to fly your drones further. Um, and they were able to ship these to the Turkish border where they were then moved over just a few miles into Syria. They captured Mosul University and it was here they're experimenting with biological and chemical agents. And it's here that you started to see some of the early drone squadrons for ISIS being built. Basil Hassan was able to move from Denmark through Turkey. He was held by the Turkish authorities for a couple of weeks, but then 
exchanged in a prisoner swap with ISIS, and then he was able to start establishing the drone squadrons on the ground. These drones were used in a rather rudimentary fashion to start with. They were sent up with their HD cameras, their GoPro cameras, to help snipers see and spot and pinpoint where targets were. But then, because terrorists aren't stupid, they realized that these drones were being shot down and inspected, taken inside and inspected by Kurdish Special Forces and Western Allied Special Forces. And so they turned them into Trojan horses. They packed them full of explosives, booby-trapped them, and allowed them to be shot down. And there are occasions where these were taken inside by Kurdish and French Special Forces, where they were unpacked, killing two Kurdish Special Forces and severely injuring the French Special Forces. This then quickly progressed. You had drones that were used to drop 40 millimeter grenades or improvised lighter munitions, so drones could carry even more of them with pinpoint precision onto Allied troop formations. Now, we often think this was done in the ones and twos, but from my research, both in the field and back learning lessons from this conflict uh, with the US Air Force, the US Navy and Special Operations Forces, we can actually see that these drones were flown in in their multiples, up to 12 in the sky all at once, 82 in the sky over a 24 hour period. They were flown fast and low at the front of troop formations and then fast and low at the back of troop formations simultaneously to create a squash in the middle and panic, which then caused troops to spread out. Then simultaneously snipers, vehicle borne IEDs and suicide bombers were sent in to pick off these troops and take apart the troop formations. It's for this reason that if you remember the advance on places like Mosul, it took much longer than Western military planners thought it would. And from my interviews with force protection officers, it really was very difficult to try and counter these drone systems. The sky would light up like a Christmas tree on the counter drone display systems because both allies had their own drone systems in the air. Uh, we, were count we were testing new counter drone systems in the area. And there are also a large amount of smaller signature commercial drones, which are very difficult to pick up. So this is some of the ways in which that was on the battlefield from European drone technologies going to the battlefield. We only need to think of the ways in which these technologies which are already in Europe can be used by hostile actors and there have been plans to use these in the UK recently with cases in Manchester and in other European cities as well. And this is just the kinetic impact. We can look at the spoofing of commercial technologies um, as Ingvil mentioned, the hacking of technologies and there are also cases where drone technology is used by police in the United States by various different departments of the US government like Chinese manufactured drones have been found to be sending information straight back to Beijing. So there's also cases of state espionage here at a time when there are heightened worries about Chinese communication systems perhaps uh, infiltrating and being a security risk to national infrastructure, then we should also tie in how Chinese drone technologies could also pose a similar risk. And it's for these reasons that I work with national governments, uh, international organizations, uh, the military and drone industries as well, to try and work on those ways in which we can safely create resilient drone societies where drones can be tracked and countered, where there is the right government's infrastructure in place to make sure that we can track and counter these systems and we can create a drone society where the public can trust it and it can flourish. Great. Thanks. Thank you so much, James. Thank you, Ingvil. Very uh, interesting uh, sort of kickoff presentations, food for thought. Um, I will ask uh, just a question to start with, and uh, I would encourage you, if you already sit with burning questions, write them to me in the Q&A, and uh, I will make sure uh, to address them. But for now, I will just kick us off with uh, a simple question, I hope, we'll see. <laughs> and I will start by asking you to, um, because you mentioned some examples, and you, Ingvil, you focus a lot on states, and James, you came with a lot of examples all over the globe, really. Mm. Um, but I would be interested in, according to your research, who are the big players in this? So where is it happening right now? Where should we be looking to and whom? You want to start? Uh, yeah, I can start. Um, everywhere. <laughs> uh, I, mean, I think I think my my talk hopefully demonstrated that, and that was just a few hand-picked examples. We can really see how drones have spread; they've proliferated. Engel said to 102 different state militaries, 
Um, we have 40 state militaries that are in the process of acquiring, of course, the largest medium altitude long endurance armed drones. But then you have, by the most recent count, at least 57 non-state actors that have acquired hostile drone and weaponized drone technologies. And it's only getting ever more advanced. We haven't even touched upon the ways in which these can be increasingly used as swarms. We look towards Syria and we can see how unknown groups, although they're believed to have been uh, YPG affiliates, had been using drones to fly into and to saturate the air defences of Russian air bases and Russian naval bases. The Russians state that they were able to get a number of them, all of them in fact, which is a miracle, um, because when you look at the actual intelligence data you see that a number of drones were able to get through and to strike um, the infrastructures within that military base. Um, there have also been cases of military personnel being killed by these hostile drones and of course civilians being killed as well. One of my worries is that you start to see a return of this back to Europe and drones on their own don't pose a massive potent threat but as I showed you about the ISIS use of them they become part of a sophisticated tactic and a system of systems and so you can and we won't be putting ideas into anybody's head but you can start to see how drones can be used to cause terror within the major cities of Europe and be used with far more blunter kinetic systems to ensure the increased terror and potency of a terrorist attack. And without effective and rapid response countering of these systems within our cities, then we're not going to be able to counter them properly at all. And we also need the legal frameworks to make sure it's legal to take down drones. Um, I can keep talking, so please just tell me to shut <laughs> the, up. The, the legal part we can come back to later, I think, because that's uh, one of my questions on my list here too. Right. Right. Uh, yeah. I mean, uh, on top of what James has just said, I think um, that's that's still because of this kind of um, distinctive commercial flavor that this, this development has, we can we can still identify some of the usual uh, suspects as, as the big players in this technology. So, um, so where do these technologies originate from? Uh, so, for example, the U.S., where um, where I think uh, interestingly, though. Um, Though in the in the past, when we looked at weapon systems, right, the the innovation came from from out of the military. So I mean, in many of the kind of the key tech that we are familiar with, like the origins of the internet, all of this was was originally um, a, a U.S. DARPA research project. Uh, but the, in contrast, um, the development that we see in AI or autonomous technologies is that most of the tech comes not from the military but from the commercial sector. Um, uh, and, and the military is kind of trying to play catch up, uh, which is quite quite difficult because they don't have the same kind of amount of money that they can invest potentially in these technologies compared to all of the kind of um, commercial actors and on the ground. Uh, there's also this kind of issue that some commercial actors are not not necessarily wild to work uh, with the military. So we've had this very public um, protest at Google, for example, who are involved in Project Maven, so one of the um, U.S. militaries. Um, defense projects where basically Google workers didn't know that they were actually working on um, on something that could be used for weapons technology and then staged a protest and in the in the in the end Google dropped uh, the project and it was taken up by by another player so um, so I think there's this kind of interesting dynamic where we we, we see that the commercial sector plays plays a significant uh, role and um, at the same time I think uh, and this kind of goes along with what James has been saying if you want to build a very, a very simple autonomous weapon systems, you could also do that because you would basically only need um, a kind of drone hardware and equip this with a facial recognition algorithm. Um, and this would not be a very precise system, but you could uh, potentially use that uh, to great effect. And I think this is the, the big worry. So as these kind of technologies spread more widely, and much of it is also open access uh, software. This could mean that it becomes increasingly easy to to equip uh, commercially available drones, for example, in, in different in different ways. And for example, this is something that uh, AI researchers in the US are also very concerned about. There's this famous video by um, which was uh, co-directed or I mean, co-planned by somebody called Stuart Russell, who's a big figure in the AI research community, uh, which is called Slaughterbots, which basically uh, yeah, links this kind of uh, activity of people in, on social media with with the kind of the image of um, of nefarious personnel releasing fifty or sixty of these killer mini killer drones who are then targeting students on the basis of what they've said on social media. Of course, this is a fictional representation, but um, but it is comparatively close to what would be technologically um, possible. Um, I think. Absolutely.
that uh, that actually leads me to uh, to the second part of that question, I suppose, which is um, in 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 all of this uh, accounting for all of these challenges and all of these problems that you mentioned, lack of regulation, um, lack of control over who gets their hands on what, right? Who are then the main stakeholders that we should be engaging with to get a handle on the problem or at least uh, be prepared for this somehow? according to you know, your research and what you're engaging with. Yeah, I mean, in terms of the problems that I'm talking about, in some nation states, there isn't so much a, a lack of the regulation, but there are discrepancies and uncertainties about how enforceable it is and how you take that legislation and you put it to use in practice. So take the Protecting Emerging Threats Act in 2018 in the United States it very much suggests that there should be a whole of government solution to this between the federal, the state and the local level, that there should be provisions and money put forward to make sure that there can be effective counter drone technologies bought and used by local forces. Um, and of course, at a federal and, and state level as well. But there's over 200 plus counter drone systems out there. Some of them are effective, some of them are very much behind the times and some of them are worse than useless because they're snake oil. And so there is a problem here because the local authorities at the state level don't know which to buy and which are most effective. And then when it comes down to actually using them, you don't know how to use them legally because the law lags behind here. So there's the case of drones being used by around, there's a, a swarm of seven drones used last year and this happened on two occasions and seven across the united states at the well world's biggest in terms of power production nuclear power plant in arizona and these drones no one knows where they came from they hovered around for hours back and forth over the um, hard water storage facilities at the nuclear power plant and no one was able to take these drones down because there is a legal ambiguity about whether or not they are deemed to be hostile if they are not, then is it legal to take these down? And also there's a, a tactical issue as well that, like I said, with ISIS using drones, they want them to be downed. These drones could well mm. be wanted to be downed into these very sensitive ecosystems like at airports or like at nuclear power plants. There's another case in China when these farmers tried to fight back against the criminals using drones by acquiring their own counter drone technologies. They had GPS frequency jammers that they were sending into the sky to make sure these drones couldn't go in. But there are reports that this was interfering with civil aviation. Mm -hmm. And of course, when it comes to broader issues, no one knows what a counter drone system will do to the intensive care unit five kilometers away at a hospital. And so we still are too early on in this technology to make sure it can be rolled out effectively. And therefore, we're still too early on in this technology to make sure the commercial aspects can be as rewarding as they want them to be, because we can't create these safe societies. Yeah, I think uh, from from my angle, I mean, because I'm looking more at these these sophisticated weapon systems that I was mentioning, I think the the, the main stakeholders are basically uh, a, a state civil society, and, but also tech workers, uh, which I think uh, and, and I think this the UN forum um, presents quite a neat summary of who are the main stakeholders in this in this topic. And I think what's really needed, as I, as, I, as I spoke about the proliferation risks, is is that. Um, um, the um, the states get a hold on themselves and and start negotiating um, international law specifically regulating uh, the use of the system and also making sure that there is a a, um, a deliberately set uh, notion of human control uh, so that they are not overtaken uh, by practices on the ground um, because I've, I sense that there's a lot of kind of tech determinism in the in the field uh, in the sense that this will happen. So we just have to get used to it, right? But uh, but of course, we as humans and as policymakers, um, um, I mean, there, there, there's, there are ways, of course, to steering this development. It's not just something that happens to us. But I think sometimes there's this um, there's this sense because the technology is so overwhelming, you don't really know where to start, right? That um, uh, that yeah, that the starting point becomes quite difficult. But I think the, for me, the starting point would be specific new international law regulating uh, weapon systems and odd lawing systems that are outside human control. Thank you. Um, maybe we can go back to the example you 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 mentioned previously um, in fiction, right? Because there's a lot of um, work in, in popular culture and fiction, novels, films, series that address both drones and uh, and weapon systems in some way or another and 
I'm actually curious to hear whether there are any sort of, are there, are there major misunderstandings in how that's presented? Is there like one of the pet peeves that you have maybe uh, with how that shows up in popular culture that everybody refers to that's just not like reality? Or on the other hand, is it a rather accurate uh, prediction at least of what can happen? And these representations that you see, um, do you perceive them as sort of more distorting the picture or maybe actually also driving the development in certain aspects? Long question, I know, I'm <laughs> just uh, throwing it out there. Um, I think maybe I can give it a start to give you um, yeah, sure. a second to talk about it, to think about it. Um, I think um, so, um, my personal pet peeve with fictional representations of AI is always that uh, there's a strong association with human qualities. So if you, if you think about AI and, and the killer robot, you always have a humanoid kind of killing machine um, that, is, that, is, that, is, that has, has a clear conscience and is out to get uh, human overlords, right? Um, I mean, not always, but I mean, the Terminator is kind of the typical representation of this. And I think this is kind of an image that um, is often associated with this debate. Um, so, for example, I remember in one of my early um, published publications on this, maybe three, four years ago, uh, was was assigned with a picture of a robotic Scorpio. You know, nobody knows why. You know, but it's, it's a kind of example of a killer, of a killer robot of not on this weapon system that has nothing to do with what is actually going on. I think the danger in that kind of is is that um, it leads us away from what are the actual actually practical problems we see now, right mm -hmm. now. So, so that it makes it seem as if this is um, something that is um, a long-term issue potentially in the far, far, far away future once we have general AI, whether, whether we ever have that is another issue for AI researchers to solve. But it leads us away from the kind of current technologies that are already in use or will be um, in, in future use very soon uh, that are very problematic. Um, and Noel Sharkey, one of the kind of key figures in this debate, who is, uh, is an emeritus professor of robotics and a big um, figure in the campaign to stop killer robots, basically always says that we should think about the current um, military robots more as, as more close to our washing machines than, uh, than the Terminator. And I think that's quite useful yeah, because we, we see more and more of our daily um, appliances uh, being integrated with AI. And these are the kind of features that we're also talking about. Um, but then we have to think about what it means that we have these comparatively stupid weapons and they're kind of set loose, right? Um, so I think this kind of, this, 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 this tendency of fiction to, to always kind of focus on the far end of the spectrum of, of a generally intelligent AI is, I think, fictionally very interesting, <laughs> but, uh, but very far away from what, what worries me most at the moment or what should worry us, I think. Yeah, I, I second that point. I mean, we often see in the, in, the non, in the fiction literature that these systems are sophisticated. They are futuristic. They can be only used by the most big budget and illicit organization to be put to use for hostile means. But whilst they are most definitely high tech, they are simple to use and they are very much a threat now. And in my work, I don't have to engage in hyperbole because we have an endless list of real life examples of how this is being done and just how much of a flaw there is, how much we're lagging behind in the ability to counter this threat. All right, um, just to the audience, I still haven't gotten any questions. So if you have any uh, questions for uh, two panelists, now would be the time to type them up so uh, I can ask them. Um, in the meantime, while uh, you're hopefully all typing, I uh, will ask another question because I, I think this is sort of what strikes me to be interesting also from this fictional um, representation of, of these issues is also the moral issue, right? And both of you have, have spoken a little bit to sort of the ethical concerns and, and moral issues that are um, behind both of the, the, the technologies that we're talking about, really. Um, Ingvil, you mentioned this, the passive role of, of humans sort of m messing with human control ideas, right? And what it means to be in control as a, as a have a human being in control. And uh, James, you also mentioned, especially I think when it comes to sort of the, the broad variety of actors that can use this for criminal purposes, for terrorist purposes, um, that that's difficult to stop, right? Because it can happen on all levels and all sort of extents. Um, so I would be interested in hearing a little bit more about where you see sort of the main ethical and, and moral concerns. And maybe also if you have ideas based on, you know, your examples and your research, how those can be addressed, taking society, um, in, in, in taking the, up the societal responsibility, for example, 
or state actors or NGOs. I, I don't know, you tell me what, uh, what you think could be uh, venues to address these questions. Yeah, um, I mean, for me, I think there's a lot of this ethical and moral responsibility lies with the commercial, the companies, the industries that are creating these systems, because, you know, in a capitalist system, any of these businesses are going to be driven by trying to make these systems as high tech and easy to use as possible. That's what drives this business. You know, you want the latest update, you want the drone that flies the furthest, that can carry us the heaviest payload, that can spray chemicals across the biggest distance to make sure that fields can be, um, have their pesticides on them in a record time, that can go the furthest so that you can deliver further into different cities or provide medical supplies. All of this is where the money is made. But do we have to make these systems? as high tech as possible to fulfill the duties that they need to fulfill. And there's people working here at SDU, like Dylan Cawthor over in the SDU uh, UAS Centre, who are working on ideas about how engineers can um, embrace and include ethical and moral aspects into their design process. Because you know, it's difficult not to want to make these systems as high tech as possible. You know, we all want to find the latest advancements and developments in our own research. Why wouldn't you want to in terms of engineering? But if you're creating those systems, then you have to have a certain amount of social responsibility. Um, and so either commercial entities can help invest in counter commercial systems as well, so that there is a parity and a, 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 an ability for them to keep up with one another, because right now one is very much underfunded and one is very much overfunded. Um, or you need to, like I say, think mindfully about reducing that capability, maybe making them slightly more difficult to use, having fail safes in place so that people can be trained how to use them properly. And so that just not any idiot like me can use them in a, uh, in a quite disturbing manner. Um, yeah, I think um, kind of complementing what, what James has just said, I think for me, the main ethical concerns um, 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 are really kind of this, this, this potential loss of human control over, over, um, over decisions on the use of force um, and kind of um, also combined with the idea that not everything that can be built should be built, I think, you know, so, um, so I think I'm, I'm, of course, I'm absolutely for, for innovation, but but uh, I think there's a certain duty of care that uh, developers of such technology have um, to make sure that their technology is, 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 is not used in, in ways that, that, that are not in societal interest. I think there's so many aspects to that question, how, how, we, how we can encourage that kind of development in, in, in a more positive direction. I mean, for example, um, of the current problems with many AI algorithms is um, this issue of um, predictability and explainability. So that most of the most effective machine learning algorithms, for example, work with deep neural networks, uh, which, which provide um, a certain consistency of output, but there's no way of knowing from the outside how this algorithm reached, reached their decision. And this, of course, from an aspect um, of control is very worrying because we humans who would use these systems if they would be integrated into weapon systems have, have no way of knowing how the, how the system calculated a certain target. So there's no way to doubt them. Uh, because they don't have really independent information um, about this. Um, so I think the, uh, to address these ethical concerns, really, it's, it's, there's a need for new regulation to prohibit systems without any human control and to think very clearly what it means for us to reign in control. And actually, by the way, there are also in, uh, tech, tech innovations that look at how we can make AI more explainable. So at least it's possible for, um, for somebody who's not... Um, um, so familiar with these systems, or even I think even for an AI research at the moment, it's 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 they can't tell us how the system reaches its 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 outputs. So I think there's I mean there is some movement in that direction that I think is quite positive. But also Emily, this is why we're here as well is to try and horizon scan, mm -hmm. to foresight scan, to make threat assessments of new technologies, and to see how they'll impact society. And you know when I'm sitting in a classroom. Um, pre-COVID um, with students or engaging via Zoom. It's our, our young students and talented students here at SDU who are coming up with some of the most inventive ways in which we can help create more resilient societies and look at the ways in which these systems can go wrong. Um, and it's exactly why we want to engage more with industry, with military practitioners and with policy as well. Yeah, absolutely. 
Um, I guess it's fitting then that I have a question from Preben here, who asks, uh, based on your definition, are there examples of an autonomous weapons system in the Danish military? Um, I think to my knowledge, I mean, there, there's no, so if, if I go back to this kind of uh, scale thing that I, that I had, right? So where was it? Um, sorry, I think I, okay. So I think there's none on this kind of far, far right-hand side, not fully autonomous weapon systems. But uh, the Danish military, I think, is also using, I mean, and I don't, <laughs> forgive me, yeah, I've only moved to this country recently, right? Um, so, but I'm pretty sure that there are also air defense systems in place that use various, yes, various autonomous automated features, because this is, this is, this is the typical uh, development stage of all modern air defense systems. Um, I mean, I have to say that um, Denmark has been silent on this entire debate. So I've, 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 I've watched, um, no, I've um, uh, participated as, as a participant observer in all of these UN debates um, and some, many of these since 2017 when the process was formalized. And I have yet to hear, to hear um, more than a single uh, Danish statement. So I think it's quite interesting, right? So that, that, uh, that, that Denmark has so far not, um, not seen this as an issue that it wants to take up internationally in, uh, in contrast to, for example, other um, European countries of, um, of a similar size um, and importance as, as Denmark, such as, for example, Sweden or the Netherlands. Um, yeah, but I can't give you the technical specifics. I can come back to that. <laughs> That's totally fair. Um, I also have the feeling that potentially there might be people uh, in the audience who are able to answer that <laughs> as well. Who, uh, we, uh, who knows? Um, I don't see any other further questions. So I was thinking maybe we could dive a little bit more into what James also has said um, in terms of sort of this, the role of the researcher in this, right? For, for state uh, cooperation, for cooperation with companies, the role of our students also. And maybe my basic question would be to begin with, um, what, what role does university research play in this? Applied, excellent academic research helps inform policy. Um, and so without conducting the research that we're conducting, without it being funded by appropriate academic agencies, and of course, by the military as well, like NATO in major concern areas, then you won't have these studies being undertaken and then you won't have excellent policy being devised that tries to create safer societies for us all. So I'd like to think that it's the work that we do that really informs and makes sure that we can create societies where the worst, well, the worst case scenario doesn't take place. And just going back to that previous question, you know, there, there will be air defense systems, like Ingvall said, within the Danish military, but also within especially specifically the Danish Navy as well. You need to have those automated target assessment systems in place because they are quicker than the human eye and quicker than the human brain, although a human will ultimately take that decision. But you have had cases in the past where machines have made mistakes or where humans have made mistakes, not within the Danish military, but within other militaries, within the US military. And then, of course, you look at um, air defense systems and you see how the M1 Tor in Iran, a Russian produced system, very much um, behind the curve of technology, a human behind it, but still made the mistake and took down Ukraine Flight 752, mistaking it for an incoming cruise missile. So if humans, with all of their senses and our superior technologies within our brains can make these mistakes, then the technologies that we create are likely to have these inbuilt biases and make the mistakes as well. And this is something that every military needs to be mindful of as they go forwards and as they procure these systems. Yes, I mean, I think I will start with the first question and then I comment mm. on what uh, James has just said. Uh, so. I think our role is be to deliver um, de um, to develop a sensitivity for, for what are the key kind of emerging issues that we as societies should care about. And although I've talked mainly about um, about weapon systems, I think many of the issues that um, relate to the safe usage of AI um, also are applicable to, to 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 very many societal areas. So, for example, I had a, 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 a chat a couple of months ago with, with somebody who works in, uh, on the topic of AI and care. And I thought maybe we don't really have anything to say to each other, right? Because our topics are so different. But many of the issues are actually quite similar, you know? So it's kind of issue of safety, of predictability, of also asking ourselves ethically, right? Um, 
is this a potential area where, where we actually want to use these systems or not? You know, so all of these kind of questions about how AI as a technology will impact our society. I think this is a this is a major research focus that is only going to grow over the next couple of years, and this is something that our students here are exposed to in various ways at SDU, and that is also helpful, I think, as um, uh, will will we'll make them very helpful uh, consultants in a number of different areas. Um, in terms of actually what you said about the um, um, the tour system taking down the Ukrainian airline, actually it is disputable whether that I mean all air defense systems typically have a manual and, auto and an automatic mode. In manual mode, the, the, the human really has an active part to play in, in kind of triggering um, uh, the system. In automatic mode, that is not the case. The system can actually do it on its own. And because that, that kind of uh, that shooting down of the plane happened uh, in a scenario when Iran was basically preparing for potential US counter strikes after the drone attack, um, <laughs> right, on an Iranian general. Um, so th there was this kind of uh, there was a, kind of a situation of heightened uh, uh, combat tension, and, and it is unclear for media reports whether that system was in in which mode it was operating. Right, so it might have been human error. It might also have been an error of the system, or what I suspect a combination of both. Right, so that that precisely because this human machine interaction is so complex, it's it's not easy to say that one side or the other was the main factor. But but uh, the, out of the interaction itself arise complex challenges and um, issues. Thank you. I uh, have a question here from uh, Morton, and I think it's mainly directed to James. Uh, so 58 non-state actors that have acquired hostile intent drones, but they are so far not really using them in Europe. And uh, they, uh, they haven't really also over the last couple of years. So we have the technology, we have the hostile intent, but why don't we see um, these type of attacks, kinetic effects used in Europe yet? Yeah, well, I mean, we have seen them used on a number of occasions, not with the explosive impact on the ground, but they have been used to scout out targets, or they have been used by states for cases of espionage, or they have been used to cause mischief and spread chaos and to spread terror, although it might not be through taking life. So I cannot go into the hundreds of examples of which they have been flown for hostile purposes around inside and outside airports, or they have been flown around the Pentagon at least 100 times in the last year, or they have been used to infiltrate even most secure sites on Earth, such as the White House. One occasion potentially hostile, the other occasion due to a drunk Secret Service worker who was enjoying flying his drone from his balcony and crashed it into the White House lawn. And then, of course, around power stations, around nuclear power stations in the UK, in France, you've had um, infiltrations into um, Copenhagen Airport, into Frankfurt Airport. You know, the, the list goes on in the way in which these can be used. And we don't know whether or not they're being used to try and fly into the engine of a plane and to down it. Um, or just like in Manchester in the UK, where there were cases to try and mix in shards of glass um, and different irritants um, into um, things that could be dropped onto crowds of people to cause panic and then filter them down alleyways to coordinate with other terrorists who can then um, increase the impact of, of, of that attack. Um, so drones are hovering above us. They are there. They are being used. I think our state entities for counter-terrorism have become much better at tracking the messaging systems, communication systems, and the radicalization of terrorists uh, in the traditional sense in terms of ISIS. But with the rise of far-right movements, one thing that worries me is that with the re-emergence of a more novel form of terrorism, without that intelligence base in place, then you actually start to see how these systems can be used by unidentified actors. So up to this point, we can track quite readily where these terrorists are and they can be intercepted just like with the Manchester case but that isn't going to be the case as we go forward into the future. Maybe uh, as, a, as a sort of a, a sub question to that or a follow-up um, maybe you can walk us through what actually happens in one of these examples like the Gatwick uh, intrusion for example so you have these drones coming in blocking air traffic well, but what, and it's all over the news, right? But then what happens after that? So how, how is regulations, procedures, how are they at the moment um, yeah. to deal with these type of... Well, if I could walk you through step by step of what happened at Gatwick, I'd be making a lot more money than I am now. That's um, the police, <laughs> totally <bad. laughs> the police, But due to the 
distant and deniable nature of a rogue drone. You don't know who is piloting it and you don't know the intention behind it. If you don't have the counter drone systems in place that can conduct a triangulation pinpointing of the signal, then you don't even know where the operator is. And due to the increased reach of drones, they can be you know, up to eight kilometers away if that's souped up perhaps even further as well. And they can fly backwards and forwards and batteries can be exchanged and they can go back in. And so you have a cat and mouse game. We don't even know how many drones were above Gatwick Airport. There were 92 separate um, recorded confirmations of drones flying in the skies of people saying they could see the drones but the police then sent up their own drones to counter the drones that have been sent up potentially by somebody who's hostile and so you've got police drones in the sky and they could be the ones that are being identified and so you have this persistent threat over 72 hours what do you do in that situation well you do the only thing you can do and you shut the airspace shut down, yeah. and then you try and figure out what's going on um, one of the things that we did as part of the UK's uh, drone inquiry and my role as advising the all party parliamentary group on drones is that there were measures brought in to increase the distance around airports in which drones can be flown. So there's far less of a chance um, that you could fly the drone into the sensitive spaces. And of course, there has been a procurement process to make sure that these triangulation identification systems have been brought in place, but also counter drone systems as well. Um, the point here is that you can try and take the drone down outside of the sensitive ecosystem that is an airport and identify where the pilot is. Um, there's also a, a belief that if you jam the frequency of the drone, that a lot of drones will fly back to their original operator so you can follow the drone back. You're stupid if you leave that enabled. So I don't believe a lot of the claims about that. Mm. Um, you know, you're not going to have this smoke signal coming up that then tracks you back to the operator. Um, instead, it will probably just crash. And then you have to worry about what's in that drone in terms of when it crashes and how much of an impact it can have again on that sensitive ecosystem. Um, so they're the things that have happened. More is happening. Law and policy takes time. Um, and my worry as well is that the technologies, the counter technologies that have been put in place are designed to deal with that perhaps one or two drones that was hostile in the sky above Gatwick. In any future attack, you are not going to have one or two drones. You are going to have at least 10, maybe into the 20s, of drones synchronized together off one mobile phone app that could be controlled by a single person that can send them off beyond line of sight from the comfort of their own shack or home or car and then sent in without having to have multiple people involved. So it is a multiplier of hostile intent. Oh, that answered your question. It, it definitely <laughs> did. Um, and painted quite a bleak picture, I would say, also for try my best. What, <laughs> what is going on. Um, I was wondering whether we could, since I don't have any more questions at the moment, um, so keep them coming if you're sitting there with a, a burning question, this is your chance. Um, maybe we could go back to this regulation, as we also talked about this question of how do we address these, uh, these technologies, right? And you've both been very good at highlighting sort of issues, right, and the lack of, of re regulation, the fact that law is behind, really, the curve uh, when it comes to development. Um, but James, you also mentioned that there's this idea to expand sort of very low key, right, this area of no fly zone around an airport to expand that, for example, there have been sort of national approaches to to um, registering drones, for example, if I remember correctly, right, to to maybe even pilot license if you do it on a more commercial basis mm -hmm. um, and these type of sort of more national based regulations. Um, how do you see, I mean, is there some sort of lessons learned between the states? Are there um, potential sort of fields where, where you see that next step of regulation is going to happen, has to happen? Um, sort of this type of, could you give us an uh, assessment of your view on that? And the same for you, uh, Ingvild, you talked about this problem of, of human control, right? This border accountability, responsibility for what if something goes wrong? Um, are there, aside from sort of this expert group coming together, are, are states taking any measures to address that? How, if yes, how, if not, why? Um, I guess would be uh, the question. Uh, short answer, um, in terms of state lessons learned on these issues, there is, there is very little. I mean, when you have a lack of coordination within the nation state, 
um, then you can start to see how a lack of coordination between nation states, which is traditionally difficult anyway, is taking place. But I would agree that this needs to increase between nation states, especially because you see the way in which drones, commercial drone technologies, as I'm talking about today, are supplied to hostile actors, both within uh, European and North American nations and um, allied nations, but also within war zones as well. Because the ability to track just how many of these are sold and moved and to stop that smuggling process is an issue as old as time. You know, one of the things that I get told time and time again when I'm talking to military personnel is they say that the AK-47 is, that the drone is the AK-47 of the sky. Mm -hmm. It is cheap, it is easy to use, and it provides that potent kinetic hostile threat, but also that intelligence threat in the sky as well. It allows hostiles to spy on you, to pick up your electric signature, which then allows you to send your mortars into that direction or missiles or whatever. So I would push towards more state cooperation on how to track the sale of these technologies down from the thermal imaging cameras up to the bigger chassis of the drones to make sure you can see where and why they're going to certain places. Um, for me, that's probably one of the most important things that we need to do as we go forwards. Yeah, I completely agree. I mean, I think the, the only thing that can really um, address the situation in any shape or form is uh, negotiating new international law. Um, I mean, at the moment, uh, this group of governmental experts, they, they have agreed on something called guiding principles on lethal autonomous weapon systems, which, but which have no legal standing whatsoever, one has to say. So they're they kind of part of a working document and they're also incredibly um, ambiguous. So they basically just point to the current state of discussion. There are other kind of voices of states who say that maybe we should have a political declaration first. And of course, it would also not be legally binding, but would at least be a step in the right direction until we can negotiate potential new international law regulating these systems. So um, um, there are also, as I said, so civil society um, actors who are getting rather impatient with the level of, um, or with the pace of, of, of debates in Geneva and are thinking now about moving this process out of this uh, particular forum, CSW, to, to, to a different forum. Uh, um, and a, and a, a treaty negotiation process that could be hosted by a state, which has happened in the past. So, for example, the Ottawa, um, Ottawa Treaty to ban landmines was initially part of a UN process that then led to a not very satisfactory end and was then taken out of this kind of forum, allowing states to participate in negotiated treaty outside of the convention of the UN system. So, for example, what I mean by that is that the CTW, where this is a negotiate, uh, where this is discussed, not negotiated. Um, it's operating by consensus. So they can only move forward uh, if, if they all agree to move forward in a certain direction. And of course, that slows down things incredibly. There's always this argument that if you move it out of this consensus-based forum, that you lose kind of the big players who are traditionally not participating in these kind of external to the UN processes, such as um, US, China, Russia, right? Um, who would, um, I think, quite likely not be participating in a negoti negotiation process for international law in this area. But at the same time, I think, um, as, as kind of also what James has been talking about is illustrating, is that even if we have international law that does not include this, these, these big players, it's still of value, right? Because we, we see that with drone proliferation, that many of um, uh, many, many actors that we wouldn't necessarily identify as, as major military players uh, are also manufacturing their own drones, right? Of course, we see the big system being manufactured by the big military powers, but there are also a lot of states in the middle category who are also manufacturing their own systems. So if, 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 if at least, right, we could catch some of these, um, these systems um, uh, through international treaty, I think that would be definitely uh, worthwhile. I also wonder the extent to which, just to cross over into your field of research, you know, there are crossovers between the conventions on cluster munitions and certain conventional uh, weapons. When you look at the way in which slightly different drone technologies are being developed. So you have the ongoing development of drone cluster bombs. You have them packed into a shell. You have them fitted to the bottom of a bomber. That shell is then released and a small timer or pyrotechnic fuse will allow that to open. And then you have the drones flying out like, you know, spiders out of an egg into the sky, each one packed with its own little brain that is allowing it to go to a preset target on the battlefield 
that then allows it to connect onto a tank or an armored vehicle or a hardened base and to explode on that point. And so you just have smart cluster bombs. Mm. And it's the extent to which we can start to see how these overlap with existing regulations as well. But like you say, when it comes to um, a consensus to agree to add these into anything, it really looks difficult of how that will happen anytime soon. Still doesn't mean we shouldn't try them. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, maybe uh, sort of because we're talking a lot about the dangers, right, and the the problems and the and the, the lack of regulation and everything of these technologies. And Ingrid, you said a little bit about why states are developing uh, or working towards optimizing uh, their weapon systems. Um, but James, you mostly talked about you know the, the the sort of the negative aspects, right, of the proliferating drone technology. I was wondering whether we could also maybe set put some more words on. The, the, the positive side effects, right, or the, the benefits of these type of technologies, what good they can do, um, because I think that's also part of why we won't be able to stop the development, right? Mm -hmm. um, so from each of your fields, maybe we can hear a little bit of on the positive effects as well. Yeah, I, well, I opened with the positives. I opened with <laughs> the, um, the ability to help us with COVID and to provide support for frontline medical responders. And of course, they've been used to spray and disinfect entire streets. So these technologies used to spray pesticides on fields have been used to cleanse entire regions of cities in places like Thailand and Taiwan and Spain. So, you know, there are very much positive ways in which these can be used and they will completely revolutionize our logistical and transportation infrastructure. I was by no means being over the top when I said we will see thousands of drones going backwards and forwards in and out of our cities above our pre-existing logistical routes. They will fly above our roads or above our rivers or above our train tracks through our countryside to make sure that they are delivering goods, but also people, but also medical supplies, perhaps acting as antennas for super fast broadband and everything else that comes through this to act as transmitters of information as well to put information directly into our TVs and into our radios and into our computers. But they will also be used, of course, to gather metadata about us as well. I really do think that there are so many positives as part of this national drone infrastructure. But as Colin Gray, the great late military strategist said, the enemy will always go towards our weakest point. And so there are vulnerabilities to that drone infrastructure. And we, if we are to appropriately trust it and to embrace it as a society without things going wrong, then we need to make sure we have these hard and fast measures in place to counter anything when it does go wrong. So what happens when there is an infiltration into the system, there has been a hacking of a legitimate drone, there has been a spoofing of it, or a rogue drone has got into the system. Well, just like at Gatwick Airport, where you take down all of your planes, you take down all of your drones. And then how do you provide all of those good things we want delivering within 30 minutes to our homes? But how do you provide the bloods and the medicines that need to go to hospitals? How do you transport the patients that are being moved by drone systems? Again, these are technologies that are under testing now. Just look on the Uber website and you can see the drones that are being made to carry people across cities um, or the Medivac systems that are being used for the battlefield and being tested at the moment. So drones will be a vital national and international infrastructure. And if you don't create safe systems to make sure these can be used safely, then it will be brought down, public will lose trust, and everyone will lose money and society will lose the ability to embrace these systems wholeheartedly and effectively. If I'm not mistaken, I think uh, SDU actually has a research project going on where they're trying to transport blood samples, right? Yes, um, absolutely. From, uh, to, to the islands and uh, sort of using drones, trying to get those uh, to the hospital as fast as possible and back. Yes, but that's all been also been done. And, you know, uh, I, I urge um, people watching to contact Dylan, who's working on this, mm -hmm. because he's also working on the fact that this can be done in a simplistic manner without creating over high-tech technologies to ensure that this is the case. And that's also beneficial because it can keep the systems lighter weight, it can make sure there is enough there to do the job properly, um, and it also makes it safer, a much safer system and um, more effective to use, and far more cost-effective. But, but look into Dylan's research. Um, I think in terms of armed autonomous systems, um, 
as I said, the, the advantages that I identified turn mostly around efficiency and effectiveness in terms of military operations. I mean, I think that, um, I mean, from my perspective, some, some of these um, um, some of these applications of AI in the military also relate to, to unarmed systems. So for example, the, this kind of idea that um, you could use, and, and these already use these systems, um, autonomous robots to clear minefields, right? Or uh, so some of these kind of tasks that I identify as dull, dirty, and dangerous, right? Mm -hmm. um, that could be delegated to robots and that are not, not necessarily all, all not necessarily all military applications of AI are kind of fall under this kind of armed aspect, right? Uh, that is, um, I think, very problematic. Um, but I think we should we should really be careful about this kind of functional logic that is inherent to 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 um, to enhancing um, AI in, in an armed fashion in the military sense, because uh, it it's. Um, Okay, it makes us lose count of, of other important um, considerations such as, such as legal ethical considerations um, and um, it makes us potentially lose track of, of what, what this will do um, if, if it really proliferates because I think many states always kind of think about um, it in the sense that they can use it uh, for, for their own militaries and how it will enable them to, to, to enhance their capabilities and um, I think that is, that is, it is rational from, a, from an efficiency point of view. But of course, it's not going to be only one state who will have access to these systems, as, as we already see with, with, with drones. So, um, so I think one has to really weigh the, um, the benefits and the challenges or the disadvantages to, 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 to full on developing these systems in, in, in every shape or way that they can be developed. I guess that also the dynamic then also works the other way, right? That um, if you're not developing them, you might be left behind. Yeah, but, but I understand that that this is an argument that many militaries are concerned with. But I, but I also think that this kind of creates this um, this kind of self fulfilling mm -hmm. prophecy, right? So you always then say, okay, I will have to develop them because others are. And I think sometimes this kind of competitive competition argument is also used to fuel development further and further without thinking about about uh, about kind of key um, key steps or key rules that should always be in place that that should hinder development of systems in in areas where, for example, they really lose human control. Mm -hmm. So I got a question from Marie here. Um, let me see, it's a little bit long. Uh, see if I can shorten this. Um, so it's mainly for you, Ingrid. Um, so you uh, mentioned that some applications of artificial intelligence already exist in warfare contexts and that they're currently being used by different countries. Um, would it be possible for you to tell us whether you perceive that there are different doctrines or different types of behaviors in states make use of this artificial intelligence? Um, so are there states, for example, that show more caution and try to keep human, the human more as part of the loop? Um, and are there more, on the other hand, than more adventurous states who sort of, you know, take the human more out of the loop? Um, and uh, yeah, so are they all sort of, she's asking whether all the states using AI are playing the same game or if there are different leaks of the AI game, basically? Yeah, thank you for those questions. Excellent. Um, I think there, there are many different games being played. Um, I mean, one of the key problems in identifying what kind of game uh, states are engaged in is the issue of secrecy, right? So as you can imagine that uh, with this topic in particular, as we're also talking about many, um, I mean, systems, some systems that are out there, but even to find out what kind of autonomous, autonomous capabilities these systems that are out there have is incredibly difficult using just open access um, information or even information gained through, for example, publications such as Jane's Defense, right? Just because what, what states want to publish about these systems um, is, is limited. And then, of course, you also have weapons manufacturers who have some interest in selling their systems. But then they, of course, also have an interest to, to kind of um, um, overstate what these systems are capable of. And combine that with kind of varying definitions of what automation and autonomy means. It means that it's very difficult to get a very clear picture of where states are heading and what states are, um, what kind of capabilities these systems have. Um, that said, I think there are um, definite cultural factors to how states uh, think about using AI that you can see very much. Um, I mean, for example, the US, for, for all of its faults, is comparatively transparent, right, about, about what it does. It's one of the few countries that has a very clear directive about autonomy and weapon systems that at least spells out um, quite clearly how it understands an autonomous weapon systems and how it's planning to use these systems in the, in the, in the, in the future and, and how they're currently using these systems. Some of these definitions are disputable, but at least we have kind of a, a roadmap, right, for what is going to happen. Um, 
some some states don't even provide us with definitions of of how they understand autonomy in in, in their weapon system so so in that sense some of the more authoritarian countries it's 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 very difficult to get access into how they understand um the role of ai and and what the system should or will be capable of doing I mean, I think generally there, there, there are definite cultural factors also to how generally um, countries relate to AI as, as a technology that might influence the decision about also military applications of AI, although I think it's, 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 it would be dangerous to make a very con concrete link here. But I sense that, for example, um, in terms of how states are talking about this topic, uh, states like Japan and uh, South Korea, who, um, whose societies um, seem to have embraced AI on robotics in a much greater fashion than many Western societies. So, for example, within um, in, in the care um, 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 care area or care for the elderly, it's very common to have all kinds of uh, robotic aids um, in, 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 in Japan's care homes. Um, and um, and that's not to say that the Jap Jap Japanese are in favor of developing autonomous weapon systems, but I think there's a different attitude to what what kind of what the what are the roles that this technology could play that I think is is likely to influence um, the general attitude of the of of the population in the country, um, um, and this is actually something also that I will deal with in my my project because I will look at um, at autonomous weapon systems and the practices of countries of four countries and specifically China Russia Japan and the US, uh, also try to figure out to what extent. They, they have a different attitude, right, to, to how these, uh, these technologies uh, should be used or could be used. Let me see. I, uh, I got a question from Lars. Um, and uh, he's asking whether it's not part of the issue uh, in terms of creating regulations or not creating regulations that uh, we have a sort of a distinction between civilian and military contexts. Um, so he says that the options, legality, counteractions, and the level of acceptance of an AI system, both defense and attack, in, in a drone attack on Gatwick Airport in peacetime versus in a military airport in a country in a state at war seem very different or not. So there's something in here about sort of, yeah, the, 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 the state that we're in, right? Are we at peace? Are we at war? Are we in a civilian setting? Are we in a military setting? Can these be distinguished and how does that affect uh, creating regulations? Is that part of the problem why it's so difficult to regulate? I hope I did your question justice last. <laughs> um, no, I, I, th I think I think they're very um, different issues in that specific respect. Um, you know, um, I'm sure Lars knows well that you can land your back in a zone of conflict and fire your gun into the sky on um, automatic, desperately trying to shoot down a drone in a battlefield, uh, as has been done on numerous occasions in Syria and Iraq, is the most effective way to counter these systems. Or you can send out your high intensity lasers on the back of your dune buggies or strikers to try and melt a drone out of the sky, as has been equipped into the US military. But they're very different technologies and you can use in an urban environment. Uh, and the laws, of course, are very different as well. And so I think actually the problems that are in a domestic context are, are far more mundane and, and benign, sadly. And they're the similar problems that you get with trying to push any legal practice through um, a government quickly. It takes uh, not months, um, but years. Um, but th that being said, even when that is pushed through, it then takes years again to try and implement that. And that's one thing we've been trying to work on quite a lot recently. Um, you have had, there's one interesting actually that might link into to Lars's point. You have had the establishment of some state militaries of specific counter drone units um, that are highly trained on these new systems and able to be kind of the supporting defense element to any forward troop movement. And it's off the, my learnings of this with um, a number of allied uh, military partners that I've been toying with the idea and work, I've been working with uh, domestic police forces since 2015 about trying to create um, domestic rapid response police units. Mm -hmm. And this would be far more cost effective, but also legally far more appropriate because they'd be highly trained in how to use these systems. They'd be able to develop these systems as well. Uh, and of course you would need fewer of them than having every single police officer having a drone gun in the back of their car or something. In the UK, we have a similar kind of response because you don't have every police officer armed with a gun to counter uh, a hostile 
uh, armed person. Instead, you have special rapid response armed units that will go and have the stuff in the back of their car or go and pick it up quickly from the station and then rapid response to the hostile situation that's going on. For me, I see that as far more of, and perhaps learning from the military here, far more of a way in which we can see future policing trying to counter this threat within our major cities, having rapid response, highly trained counter UAV teams at a local level, level in urban environments, but also in rural environments, because farming will be vulnerable to this, just like we've seen in China, to try and make sure we can create an effective counter drone infrastructure. Um, I think, Maybe I'm reading your question in, 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 the, in the wrong way, but I mean, I was wondering whose acceptance are you talking about? So are you talking about public acceptance or acceptance among kind of, um, policymakers involved in civilian and military context? Um, so because there seems to be this kind of speculation that potentially public acceptance of these systems in a war type scenario would be higher. Um, I mean, at the moment, public opinion globally is, is quite clearly the um, majority is quite clearly against uh, development of autonomous weapon systems that are outside of human control. And even I think in the military, it's not a very clear cut story. So, um, I mean, the, the history of the US development of unmanned systems is kind of riddled with, with systems that were given up, although they were technologically feasible at much earlier times, because there, there seems to be this, this deep kind of cultural reluctance almost to, to, to relegate control and um, to, um, and even now, of course, to, I mean, if we talk about drones, there's still remote control systems um, at, 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 at this point. But if we talk about more autonomous systems, they're more unpredictable. I think this issue of control will play an even bigger role in the military setting. And I think generally there seems to be a, a deep and kind of uneasiness even about how drone operators are treated. So whether they're really treated in the same way as, 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 as soldiers in battle, although of course they also have, 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 have been on the battlefield, although not, although virtually, right? Um, so I think there's, there's, there's a whole lot of questions here about, about acceptance that, uh, that we would need to unpick. Absolutely. And maybe um, we can dive a little bit more into this because this is part of this connection between civil military relations, right? So this dual use of not only the technology, but potentially also regulations, right? Um, is, is, is a good question here. And you both mentioned it that, you know, it's developed by companies, but then used in a military context, for example, or used in a, in a peaceful context, but then with the potential of uh, that actually becoming a target or, or something like that. So maybe um, you both could put a little bit more words on this sort of civil uh, problematic that you see for drones and, and, and for AI and what that has in terms of consequences um, for both regulation, future development, but also your research. Yeah, I mean, I don't think there's enough of it. I don't think there's enough dialogue between the civil policy and military establishments. Um, and, you know, trust is obviously an issue there. But this is something that we're trying to do with the vulnerabilities of the Drone Age project. We're holding advanced research workshops that will bring together people from the military, various different militaries, who are drone specialists, but also with counter UAV industrial experts and academic experts as well to discuss these problems, create the links and work together. Um, so we're at a point now where we're, we're trying to foster that even more, because like you say, it really is important. I think that's a massive question. <laughs> so um, I totally agree. <laughs> um, so maybe, maybe I will just tackle one particular aspect of it. So um, I, th I, I think that this is this is quite a quite a major factor because I think, as I said, contrary to previous tech developments, uh, really this the, the civilian sector is in the lead here and, and significantly in the lead. Um, um, in terms of AI and applications of AI, so if, uh, and um, but, but I don't think that these uh, so um, the, the, these these companies are necessarily as a collective aware of the fact, right, that they they have such a such a major force, uh, which has a major role to play in shaping uh, what 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 could be emerging standards in this area. Um, I think I think there's more awareness of that of of that kind of happening, but I mean definitely there should be more interaction between the the political and the uh, sorry the the not just the military, but also just political decision makers and commercial decision makers. And, and I think we don't see a whole lot of that, which I find quite surprising, given that this technology is influencing our lives uh, in, so, in so many different ways every day. And I think militarily, uh, um, um, we see that tech companies in the US, for example, come down on, on one of the two sides. And they're basically, uh, I think either the, the US military, if they want to engage more civilian companies, they either have to convince 
uh, some of these tech companies to actually uh, work with the DOD, which they might not be terribly interested in because um, for various reasons, for ethical reasons, um, also for reasons of time scale, um, for reasons of uh, commercial interest, right? Um, um, but then it also comes down to the individual tech workers, I think, who, who are also beginning to, um, to develop a, um, a different awareness, I suppose, about, the, about their role in these companies and about their role in these kind of big societal questions about the applications of um, AI. It's also difficult as well because these are incredibly specialized topics. Mm. You know, I in nowhere fully um, to grips with AI and how it advanced mm. or quantum or the Internet of Things and how it's impacting mm. our lives or how metadata is being collected and manipulated um, or how drone technology is perhaps maybe a bit more my area, so I do understand that. But when you go to give evidence to policymakers, whether it be a, a defence select committee or foreign affairs committee or something, then, you know, MPs, members of parliament, are, the people we elect are not experts on this stuff. They are broadly very intelligent people, hopefully, but they are not experts on this stuff. And so it's our job, of course, to try and explain this in an accessible way, but also for commercial entities to make sure that this is publicly digestible as well. So we understand the real positives that we're getting from this, but also potential negatives here. And so that communication is so important to policymakers to make sure that it's mm. on the map, it is aware so that they know what's going on. And I worry that, you know, as we go more and more down these, these routes of things like quantum and AI, it becomes even more difficult for the layperson to understand um, and for us to understand how that is going to fundamentally change and impact our societies. I think that's precisely the task, as you were saying, right? So that's that I think that's that's kind of the purpose of a research in a more broader sense, right? So yes. that's uh, that's um, that we need kind of this link between between the kind of more technically focused experts um, and the policymakers, which could be kind of you know, research done by political scientists, by people who study history, by people who study um, sociology, international law, right? So exactly kind of students that we're educating um, here in, at SCU. Um, because we need kind of people who are able to, to, to know enough of the technical stuff without kind of, um, of course, being a tech experts, but also be able to communicate this in ways and shape or forms that are accessible to policymakers uh, nationally and internationally. And the younger students understand the new technologies far more than perhaps <laughs> the policymakers and the older academics, That's of which I include myself. Yeah. You absolutely, you uh, basically stole my follow-up question ah. to my first question, which was exactly about the role of political scientists in, ah. in this dialogue. So really? thank you for answering that. I think that was very, uh, very interested and very necessary. Um, I have a question here from Lars. Um, he's asking whether your research indicates a different level of acceptance, public and policymakers to AI systems used in life-saving functions, for example, healthcare, healthcare mm. versus military functions. Thank you, Lars. Um, I don't have the numbers for that, I'm afraid. So, I mean, I'm, um, I, I mean, I, I wonder whether there, I mean, one, I guess you kind of assume that there's an intuitive link, right, between kind of functions. Um, at the same time, I think that um, there's some, I mean, I just know that, that there's this global majority that is opposed to autonomous weapon systems. And, and that this kind of is replicated as a survey every couple of years, and it, seems, it only seems to be growing, right? Um, of course, there are national differences, but, but there is always a majority of the population who is opposed to autonomous weapon systems. Um, I think other, um, I, I really think that uh, we're only just starting this conversation about what, what kind of applications of AI do we think is, are acceptable. And the interesting thing is because there's no regulation, some of these things are just used, right? And then only after use are people starting to think about whether this, this is actually acceptable, right? I mean, so this, this conversation I had, as I said, with this person who does, um, um, who looks at AI and care. So that was about, um, about um, um, kind of a care home specifically for, for, for people with Alzheimer's. Who were then who were basically recorded all the time, um, uh, and then I was assessing their kind of behavioral patterns to see whether they would be likely to suffer an episode of some kind. And in a way, this sounds this sounds beneficial and nice, but of course, these are these are vulnerable um, um, elderly patients who who can't really consent to the kind of to to, to in, in a sense um, being part of a, of an experiment on AI and social care, right? So I find it a bit. Um, I mean, there are obvious ethical dimensions to this, right? Um, which I think not not as easily solved. 
And just because there is at the moment no specific regulations for this, I think in any country, um, this um, apart from of course the general ethical guidelines that are not specific to AI at all, these these kind of things can just be be done, right? Um, uh, so I think it's really time for 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 broader societal conversation on um, on what are the potential functionalities of AI that it can do, but also whether we want that, right? And I think this is this is just kind of one of the cases. There are so many cases where we have seen. Um, algorithmic bias, right? Um, if we talk about uh, decisions about credit, right? Decisions about um, about housing, right? Um, that have all been influenced by by AI algorithms in a in a in a negative way, uh, that uh, nobody ever consented to, right? They were just kind of done in this way. Um, so I think as people are becoming more aware of all of these different applications, there's also going to be a more a growing critical awareness of, um, or hopefully, a bigger societal conversation about whether we want this kind of uh, use of AI, right, uh, um, or not, in fact. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Lars. That's a good question. Um, if there are no more questions from the audience, then I think it's about time I asked my last question, because I'm actually at the bottom of my very long list of uh, questions <laughs> I wanted to ask our two panelists here today. And I think my last question would be just if you sort of had to summarize your research into one sort of the main takeaway points, keeping in mind that we have an audience sort of on, based on the in the military and in, in private companies, what's what's the one thing you would want them to take away from today? What do you think is most important? Sorry, big question. I know. <laughs> um, if you want to make the most of drone technologies domestically, then we need to make sure that we have these infrastructures in place in terms of government policies and legal aspects, but also in terms of a quite rigorous and well-tested counter drone system as well. That transfers over into the military because these counter drone systems to be effective, of course, are very much important for the military when they're out in mission, because as I've seen in my research and from my extensive interviews, drones are going to be an ever present threat on the battlefield as much as they are back in Europe as well. One of the things that sticks in my mind when I talk to military personnel is that they have lost tactical air superiority on the battlefield. And so all of us need to work together to make sure we can create the counter systems that can secure both the military, but also back in our own societies in Europe and with our allies. Thanks, James. Okay, I think um, my takeaway would be that um, we should think long and hard about what it means to, to retain human control over systems with autonomous features and also what it means to lose that control. And we should think about this. Um, I think I would just encourage commercial actors but also military actors to see themselves as agents in this process. So they're not determined in a way by the path of the technology, they can shape the path of the technology. And this also means that they can um, um, yeah, think about what it really means to retain control and ensure that uh, the retention of that control actually happens, as opposed to being on the slippery slope of an incremental process towards losing that control step by step and then suddenly noticing that it is gone. <laughs> Thank you both so much. Well, then I don't think there's much left, but to me, uh, but for me to thank our audience for good questions, for engaging with us. We're so happy you could join us here. Um, and we really hope that this is just the first step in, in, in having a dialogue. And we would be really interested in hearing sort of your perspectives and the work that you do and how that uh, sort of relates to drones, relates to AI, relates to this broader question of, of technological development and society and warfare. That's what we're here for. That's what you're there for. And we hope, uh, yeah, we can uh, keep that dialogue uh, growing and going. And um, as the next step, I know that uh, our colleagues at Rio will be in touch with uh, contact details and also a thank you email. So uh, please do not hesitate to get in touch with us about uh, anything. And we hope uh, yeah, to uh, see you soon and uh, after Corona, maybe even in person. That would be very <laughs> nice. Have a lovely evening. Thank you from us. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Emily, as well. Great yeah, question. Thank you both. <laughs>